Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, if you would like some or any of the rewards you see on screen, feel free to check out my Patreon, link at the top of the description of the video. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help me out considerably to keep the channel running. It is of course entirely optional, but it would be pretty awesome if you join, and the perks, if I do say so myself, can be pretty sweet. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable. Hold on to your reality, and let the darkness take control. My girlfriend and I have been together for about a year, and never had any big problems. We are both pretty relaxed people, and have never had a big fight, never had trust issues, the whole shenanigan. So one day I was out in front of my apartment building smoking a cig. This was before we lived together. I had seen her the night before, had a nice dinner, and gone out to a bar, then gone to my place after which she took a taxi home. As I'm standing out in front of my apartment building, she pulls up in a taxi. I wasn't expecting her and was pleasantly surprised to see her. I put up my cigarette, smiled, walked up to her and said, Hey, what you doing here? She then scowls at me, slaps me square across the jaw, and I'm dumbfounded and a loss for words. So I kind of just look at her. She never said anything, just barged past me into the building. I follow her up to my apartment, asking her what was happening. The whole way she goes up, she goes into my apartment, and grabs her bag and some of her stuff she left there, throws a few things at me, breaking a glass or two, and knocking down a bunch of stuff on a shelf. She calls me a pig, says she knows everything, and that I've broken her heart. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, obviously, and she stops on her way out when I touch her sleeve, glares at me again, and slaps me. She tells me something along the lines of, I hope I never see you again, and walks out. I followed her to the street, and she got in her cab, and drove off. The street was pretty empty, and this was about 8 or 9am. I watch her drive off, and at this point, I'm lost for words, scared, and sad. Then as I'm watching the cab drive away, someone hugs me from around my waist from behind. I turn around and it's her, in running clothes. She was wearing heels and a leather jacket before, and I went completely pale. Hi, she says, in her usual happy-go-lucky tone. Then she noticed my look and said, what's wrong? I had spun around, no taxi. It had literally driven away five seconds earlier. No way it could have turned in that time, and all the lights were red. I didn't say anything to her, I just ran upstairs. Her bag was gone, the things were still broken, and my door was still wide open. So I told her. We were both momentarily confused. There's no way I could have mixed her up with someone else, and she's an only child. We had security check the cameras, and sure enough, me following a girl into my apartment. The angles weren't great, and the film wasn't great quality, but it was pretty easy to see me and my face, but hers was always hard to make out, and it looked a hell of a lot like her, but never a clear shot. No way it was the same girl. It still creeps me out, and I don't really talk about it. We also filed the police report. They came, gathered up the broken stuff, and found only my fingerprints and my girlfriend's on them, same as with my door. And this girl got into the building by herself, which means she knew my door code. Her typing is on the footage. I just hope I never see her again. A little while later, I had a professor from Colombia who's a family friend, and we spoke about this situation hypothetically, and not wanting to sound the fool. He teaches something like philosophy, and other things to do with superstition and explaining the unexplainable. 
One of his explanations was very close to this. Somehow, a mirror of our world running a nearly identical timeline folded over ours or collided with ours temporarily. Maybe she saw me at the bar the night before with another girl, my girlfriend, not seeing her face and decided to break up with me the next morning, come to my apartment, and then the amount of a disturbance that resulted in caused our two worlds to break apart right as she drove away. I'm not really one to believe in those things, but after this, I don't consider anything impossible. That also makes me wonder if it's true. How much did I mess up in this mirror world? Things can't possibly be the same there now as she broke up with me. I don't know. It's a lot to think about. This is the first time my girlfriend and I have gone into really thinking about this for a while. And it's scared and shaken me a lot. In February 2018, I decided to renovate my kitchen. It was a remnant from the late 80s slash early 90s, chosen by my grandparents, as it was their house originally. I couldn't afford a complete refit, so I researched decorating techniques and products that I have gained enough confidence in using in order to tackle the job myself. I'm a fairly anal person, organized to the nth degree, so when I removed the cupboard doors, I made sure to put all the screws from each door inside the cupboard I had removed them from. So I had every single screw accounted for. I did my cleaning and decorating, very pleased with the outcome. And eventually, it was time to put the cupboard doors back up. I was alone, and thought I had no trouble putting the doors back on, since I had been the one to take them down in the first place. I picked up the first door, Glad to see I still had all my screws lined up where I had left them. I struggled to get the door lined up, since I was balanced on step ladders and the hinges which I had left attached to the cupboards for convenience. I decided they wouldn't lined up and sit them where they need to go. This struggle made me drop the screw in my hand and I heard it hit the floor. From that height it should have bounced, but I didn't hear that second thud and it should have made it on the linoleum. There was nothing on the floor to obstruct its fall. I had cleaned everything from that corner of the kitchen, so I could get on the stepladder and put it inside safely. So, there was nowhere for this screw to go. I put the door down and searched everywhere. It wasn't where it should be, which confused me. I searched in the sealed alcove, that used to house my under-counter refrigerator, over the floor, even under appliances across from the other side of the room, in case of some miracle that it rolled that far, but I found nothing. Writing it off as yet another strange occurrence, I decided to use another screw from a cupboard I had yet to renovate, thinking that I would buy a replacement at the DIY store later. My work was interrupted by a phone call from my mother, who often calls me on my days off. And after a little chat, she asked me how my decorating was going, since she hadn't seen my efforts for a few days. I told her I was putting the cupboard doors back on, but I lost a screw, and she went a little quiet. She then began telling me how she had just emptied her washing machine that had just finished its cycle. It's a routine for her to put all the clothes the right way out when she pulls them out of the washer, before placing them on the drying rack. And when she put her hand in her sock to pull it the right way out, she pulled a tiny screw out of it. I joked and said my screw had gone to visit her, because it definitely wasn't here on my kitchen floor. And even though she couldn't understand how a screw had ended up in her washing machine, especially in a sock, she had worn the day before. She said if I could use it, then I should. And she saved me the screw, so I didn't have to go to the shop to get one. I wasn't convinced it would be a useful screw, but agreed. So she came to visit as she only lives two streets away. And when she put the screw in my hand, my gut turned over, 
and the colour drained from my face. It was the same size, with the same amount of rust, and I triple checked to make sure I had every other screw. And I did. And nothing could explain how a fairly specialised size of screw could end up in my mother's sock in her washing machine. There was only one explanation. It was my screw. When I was 18, I worked at my uncle's gas station. On Fridays, I would do the overnight shift. The story starts off with me by myself in the gas station. It's the middle of winter, and it's about 2am. Winter season is extremely slow. I haven't had a single customer in over an hour. I start to clean the store and make some coffee when a customer stops at the pump. The guy gets out. It's a short Italian guy wearing one of those Puma tracksuits with a wife beater under it and sporting some bling around his neck. He was driving a dirty old little car. I have no idea what type it is. And I just say to the man, how's it going? What can I get you? This is New Jersey, so I have to pump the gas. The guy reaches into his back right pocket and pulls out a money clip with all $20 bills in it. He looks at the price, then down at his money and begins to count. I say again to the man, what's it gonna be? He looks up at the price, down at his money and finally says, I'll have 22 bucks of the regular. While I was putting the nozzle into his car, I thought to myself, that's weird, $22? He clearly had plenty of money to make it even, but in the end, why should I care? So, as the car was getting its $22 worth of gas, I followed the man into the store. I stop at the doorway just to keep an eye on him, and he goes directly to the cold drinks, stops and stares at the first cooler in front of him. Then he looks to his right, then looks to his left, then turns around and walks out to his car. I was like, okay, weird, but by now the gas is done, and I walk up to his car, and then the man asks, how much do I owe you? I look at him with a confused face and say, 22 man. He says okay, and gives me two $20 bills. I give him his change, and then he goes on his way. Not two minutes go by, and I get another customer. It's an Indian guy driving a really nice SUV Porsche, and he's wearing some really nice looking clothes. I meet him in his car at one of the pumps. As he's getting out, I greet him and ask him what he wants. Now in this moment, I had that sense of deja vu overcome me. Because he started doing everything exactly the same as the Italian guy did. When I asked what he wanted, he simply reached into his back right pocket and pulls out a money clip with all $20 bills. He looks at the price, down at his money, and I asked again, but already knew the answer. He looks at the price, then his money again and says, I'll have $22 of the regular. Now at this point, I'm kind of freaking out. It feels like an episode from the Twilight Zone. The guy walks into the store, goes directly to the cold drinks, does the same thing as the Italian guy did. Looks right, looks left, turns around and walks to his car. I'm thinking to myself, is this really happening? By now the gas is done. I rack up the nozzle and the Indian guy asks, how much do I owe you? I say with a gasp, 22 bucks. I've had a few moments that I feel fit the mold of a glitch in the matrix. The first really big instance I can remember began so innocently. My then fiance and I were watching something on Netflix, probably The Office, when she got up to get a drink of water. We lived in a studio that was very well arranged for the square footage. The kitchen had a bar separating it from the rest of the living room, and a wall at the end of the bar that prevented you from seeing into the kitchen from where the couch was located. The bedroom didn't have a door, but it did have an entryway instead of just being open. 
My fiancé calls my name rather loudly for how close I am to the kitchen from my spot on the couch. She comes around the wall from the end of the bar with that giant nervous smile she always got when she was seriously freaked out. What's wrong, babe? I ask. Just come here. This is going to sound stupid, she says. She pulls me up from the couch and I follow her around the corner to the kitchen and up to the sink where she is pointing. Did we have one of those before? She says, pointing to a sprayer on our kitchen sink. A sprayer which definitely we did not have. It didn't even exist before she'd pointed it out. I feel myself go white, which may sound silly given that there was no danger. But I will tell you it was a very uncomfortable thought to know that something could just materialize like that. I pulled the sprayer out and tested it to see if it worked, and it did. I looked at Sandy and said flatly, Nope, it wasn't. I remember there being a little circular metal cover where one should be installed. And I'm pretty sure I asked the landlord if the sink had one when I saw the model unit. And he told me that it did not, but that he could have installed one if I wanted it. But he said that we could have one installed if we wanted it. I am sure I said something along those lines, but with a lot more stumbling around, as my thoughts were dumbfounded. I should also mention, no one had been to do any work on the sink at this point. Our garbage disposal broke a few months later, but there was no point at which a sprayer could have been installed. Sandy couldn't talk, and she began to panic. I sat down on the couch with her and turned on the show, so that she could have something else to think about while we tried to figure out another way to prove that we were both just completely spaced out and that the nozzle existed. It took me about 10 minutes to remember that I had taken pictures of the apartment the day we moved in, documenting any damage so that we would not be responsible when moving out. Surely there must be pictures of the sink there, I thought. I flipped through my gallery until I came to the first of the 20 or so pictures of our studio apartment. About halfway through where the pictures of the kitchen should have been, five or six of the images had been corrupted and were just black. No other pictures in my entire gallery had been corrupted, just the ones that should have shown our kitchen, and more importantly, the sink. I felt the color drain from my face even more, if that were possible. I explained to Sandy what I found, and she didn't believe me until I handed her my phone. That probably wasn't the best idea, because I spent the rest of my night comforting her. I will say, that around four hours later, she randomly said, Oh, I remember using the sprayer, and promptly stopped being freaked out. My honest opinion, given how stable my now ex fiance was, is that she could not handle the idea something so bizarre could happen, and fabricated a memory to ease her mind. That would not be the first nor last time she invented something happening to make her life a little easier. On another occasion, I was out driving with the same ex in the passenger seat. She had this thing where she liked to count how many dogs she saw in a day, which was admittedly pretty cute. Well, we saw this guy walking his dog. The dog was on a leash. We didn't get a good look as we were driving by at a decent pace. And as we passed the man, he passed behind a telephone pole just before an underpass. As he emerged from the other side of the pole, we both saw there was no dog with him as he came into view. There was a small wall alongside where the man was walking, and for the dog to have gone anywhere, he would have had to have run directly into traffic. Not only that, but the man just continued walking with no leash and no dog, and no panic of an owner or dog walker just having lost hold of their leash. We looked at each other wide-eyed, and I asked her if she saw the dog, and she said she did, as she was just about to count it as it was the first dog she'd seen that day. She described the exact same thing I witnessed, 
that when the man crossed behind the telephone pole, the dog went behind him, but didn't come out the other side. I'm sure everyone listening to this is aware of how hard it would be to miss a dog crossing behind a telephone pole. Even if it turned to line up with the pole. And why would it do that anyway? Anyway, I found it very disconcerting. Many years ago, I awoke after what was easily the most vivid and detailed dream I'd ever had. In this dream, my life had simply gone on and on. I got married, moved, changed jobs, had a house and kids, and nothing was out the ordinary. Then suddenly I woke up, and I was back in my small Boston apartment, lying next to my girlfriend and it was like a huge part of my life had never happened. The closest way I can describe it would be the feeling you get if you woke up one morning and found yourself wherever you were 15 to 20 years ago. Everyone you'd ever met in those years never existed. Every life achievement you had was a lie. Every memory was false, and your entire life had instantly rewound back to a random moment many years in your past. I was so shocked and traumatized by this, that I remember waking up and sobbing uncontrollably for hours, like I was grieving for the death of all my family, which in a way I was. The unexplainably bizarre part to me was how mundane this dream was. Nothing dreamlike or surreal happened. It felt absolutely like real life. The only difference was the time scale. In this dream, the time elapsed and was easily at least 15 or 20 years. To this day, I can still recall bits and pieces, including vague memories of my family's face. And I start to feel like I'm going to cry again. And sometimes I can also start to get emotional at the thought that someday, I may not remember anything of the dream at all. And all those people and life memories will be gone forever. I'd never had anything like this happen before nor since. But it's still one of the most deeply scarring events that's ever happened to me. And one that I have yet to explain or understand. I was sleeping with my girlfriend in her grandmother's house. This night, she was crying because her grandmother had been acting very mean to her. So I woke up from bed and tried to go downstairs to speak to the grandmother. I had to cross another room to get to the stairs. When I got in there, the place was dark as hell. I couldn't find the light and couldn't see my own hands. After a few steps, I couldn't even see my girlfriend's room even though I'd left the door open. So I made my way to the opposite wall, where there should have been a door. But all I touch is wood. No furniture, no door. Only wood everywhere I put my hands. At this time, I saw some grey smoke from the corner of my eyes, at the place where a mirror should have been. I started freaking out a little bit and I decided to go take my phone into the bedroom to make some light. I couldn't see the bedroom, so I followed the cries of my girlfriend. I couldn't call her, because she was trying to sleep. The cries get louder. I find a door, I turn on the lights, and I'm not in my girlfriend's room. I'm in the stairs, at the exact opposite place I was supposed to be. This made no sense according to the directions I took in the room, and the source of the cries. So I go downstairs to speak to the grandmother. Then I go back upstairs. This time the room wasn't so dark anymore. I could clearly see the furniture and the door of my girlfriend's room. Strangely, there was no wood. The walls were now stone. I really didn't know what all the wood was when I touched it before since nothing matched the surface I felt under my fingers. I get in bed with my girlfriend and she asks me, why did you sleep in the other room? 
I haven't, I said. Don't lie. I heard you in bed with the mattress squeaking. Turns out she felt like I had left for far longer than I had, and she couldn't see the door of her own bedroom during all this time. The day after we tried to investigate the room, but there was definitely no wooden surface. We asked the grandmother who told us several people had died in this room, as it's a very old European house. She'd also fallen unconscious twice in this very place, one year ago to the day. This happened some months ago, and I still can't explain what happened this night. I live in New York, and have done for a number of years. I spend most of my free time in Central Park, to the point where I could be dropped into any part of it, and know where I was, and find my way to any other point in the park without issue. Which is why this is so disturbing. I was walking home the evening from the west side of the park. I had to walk directly across a wide open field to the east side of the park. No winding paths, no obstructions to get around. Just walk straight across some ball fields while looking directly at a distinctly ugly building on the east side. I walk for about 15 minutes towards the distinctively ugly building, which puts me on the east side of the park. I pass some guys playing baseball and a playground with a big concrete climbing thing, and walk a few more minutes and exit on the street. Immediately I know something is wrong, but it's so bizarre that it takes me a minute to figure out what. The park is on the wrong side of me. Sure enough, I look up, and the sign says W a hundredth. I'm back where I started. Feeling incredibly disoriented, and all around confused. Okay, that was weird. I must have just spaced out somehow, and gotten turned around. Back into the park I go, and this time I make it a point to keep checking that the distinctively ugly building on the east side is in my line of sight and concentrate. I walk halfway across the field, checking the distinctively ugly building. I walk past the same baseball game, distinctively ugly building still good to go. I walk out of the field onto the path, past the playground with the climby thing, and follow the path out of the park. My heart sinks immediately. W 100th Street. I'm now legitimately freaked out. I can't decide if it's some weird house of leaves kind of stuff, or if I'm having some kind of blackout, and neither idea are comforting. I try to logic it out, and figure out where I could possibly have turned around. And I can't. I didn't walk back past anything. Not the ball players, not the playground, or not the field. I seriously consider just taking a cab, but suddenly feel sympathy for every idiot horror movie protagonist, because I just have to know. I walk into the park again, retrace my steps exactly, keep my eye on the distinctively ugly building just like last time, and walk past the same baseball players, the same as last time, onto the path and just past the playground with the concrete climby thing. I follow the path out the park, and I'm on E 100th Street. I still have no idea how it happened. I've never been able to replicate it. Logically, there must be something weird about the line of sight or the little stretch of path leading out. Less logically, Olmsted was a creepy wizard, who created portals, and I took a quick stroll through the twilight zone. I live with my boyfriend and his parents. There is a large bay window where the walls round out into the kitchen. The sliding glass door is close to it. So you can see through this sliding glass door, a small stretch of wall, and then the bay window. My boyfriend's mum and I got done talking in the kitchen for a while, and she went upstairs to have a nap. 
I looked out the sliding glass door from an angle and saw his mom in the exact same outfit I saw her wearing and everything, walking from the side of the house out to the yard. The small wall was blocking my view. So I went up to the bay window to see where she went. No one was there. My boyfriend was coming down the stairs. So I had him check and literally no one was there. No explanation. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. I'm creeped out and now can't sleep. I have three separate experiences to share. The first is when I was 15. It was an ordinary school day. And I was on the bus going to school. Usually I sit by the window and watch all the buildings that we pass by. So I happened to memorize the ones that stood out. One of those was an old grocery store that is right next to a pet shop where I bought my dog. I know that once I pass those buildings, I am five minutes away from school, and that I need to get ready. So again, I was on the bus going to school. And it hadn't been 15 minutes since I boarded the bus. When I looked out to see that we had just passed by the grocery store and pet shop. I was stunned and confused. I didn't remember dozing off or anything. Looking around, I realized I was the only one confused. So I calmed myself down. Once I was done arranging my stuff, putting on my necktie and such, I looked out the window. And to my absolute shock, we were passing the grocery store and pet shop again. The girl sitting next to me probably saw my face turning pale and asked me what was going on. Of course, I made up an excuse saying I suddenly felt dizzy as I didn't want to sound crazy. The second event was at my best friend's house for movie night. It was a Saturday and I planned on spending the evening with her and her brothers. Anyway, to get to her house, I have to ride a train. My stop was on the 12th station after I initially boarded the subway. And it was a bit of a habit of mine to stop what I'm doing every time the train stops so that I know where I'm currently at. I was on my fifth stop back. And then as usual, I turned my eyes from my phone to the doorway to see where I was. It was the seventh station. I waited for the doors to close. Then I looked down at my phone again to continue reading. A few minutes later, the train slowed down again, as it reached the next station. Once it finally stopped, the doors opened, and I realized I had reached my destination. I even blinked twice to ensure I wasn't seeing things. But sure enough, we were really here. I scrambled to get my things and ran out the doors. And when I finally calmed myself down, that was when the shock came. How in the world had I managed to pass five more stations without noticing? I told my friend about this one once I reached her house. And she mentioned that it was something like a glitch in the reality. It kind of annoyed me to see that this amused her to know that I experienced something like it. But nonetheless, I ignored it and we went on with our day. This third experience happened in my own home recently. I usually wake up early to prepare breakfast for my younger siblings, especially if our mum is away on business trip. It's my obligation as the eldest after all. And my youngest sister Mari usually wakes up at around seven, just before I finish preparing breakfast. And she has the habit of asking loudly, What's for breakfast? That particular day I woke up extra early, but started making food nonetheless. I thought that if I finished early, I would have time to play video games for the rest of the day. I finished cooking around 630. And just as I was about to clean up, I heard footsteps coming down from the stairs. It sounded like the other foot was being dragged as the person walks much like a zombie. That instance, I knew it was Mari. She's the only one who walks like that in the mornings. Sure enough, as if on cue, she asks from the doorway, 
What's for breakfast? My back was turned, but I still answered her. Eggs and pancakes. I know you and Dina like them. Then I heard a small humming response. When I turned to look a few moments later, there was no one there, and there wasn't a sign that anyone had been there except for me. A chill ran down my spine, and at first I thought I saw a ghost. But then I remembered what my friend had told me about the glitches in the matrix. And I thought this was another one of those. It was nonetheless, very confusing and creepy. This happened about 11 years ago, when I was working as a logistics operative in a warehouse in the UK. I worked with a good bunch of people, one of them being my mum. She helped me get the job there. And as we were very close, I enjoyed working with her. The warehouse we worked at had shelves upon shelves of products, which lined the length of the warehouse, and it had a walkway through the middle. Off to one side was the packing area for products that were ready to be shipped out to customers. I was in the packing area on this particular day with the rest of my colleagues and was facing the shelves. I glanced up and saw my mum walking down the walkway and she was looking at me. I smiled, but she didn't smile back and just kept walking with a blank expression on her face, which is not like my mum at all. She's a very happy person. Everyone likes her. And like I said, we're very close. So there's no way she'd look at me without acknowledging me. I look at her with confusion sprawled all over my face, still watching her walk up the walkway away from me and everyone. Apart from the non expressive look on her face, I remember thinking something else wasn't quite right with how she looked. There was something different that I couldn't put my finger on. Her eyes, they looked hollow, like I was looking into a dark abyss. I looked down for a split second to the job I was doing behind me, through a door that you have to have a key card to open. At that moment, my mum walked in. I was so confused. It wasn't possible for her to be walking through the warehouse, and then be behind me in a matter of seconds. I would have seen her if she had tried to go past me. There was no other way around. I asked my mum where she had been. And she said she'd been with the customer service team upstairs for the past half hour, trying to sort out a query. My face must have said it all. Because my mum asked me what was wrong. But I didn't answer. I sprinted down the warehouse all the way to the back, looking down every aisle, but found no one. I got back to my mum as she asked me again. And I told her exactly what I'd seen. She was creeped out, but she believed me. Nothing like this has ever happened since. And it really freaked me out. It still does to this day. And I have no idea what that thing was. But all that I know is that it definitely wasn't my mum. We arrived at a Canadian roadside camping ground in BC. When we got there around 10pm, it was full of people, big trailers, big four wheel drive cars, some RVs, the whole list of usual suspects. Nobody seemed to really know each other. It was just people like us traveling through. We had a long ride behind us, pitched our tent and went to sleep. We set an alarm for early the next day to maybe catch some early wildlife and get on the road before everyone else. The alarm was set at 5am. When we woke up, the entire campground was empty, not a trace of anyone, no trash anywhere. But then again, it is Canada. And when the park ranger came around to collect the overnight fee, we asked him what was going on. He looked at us like we were seeing ghosts. He didn't see anyone except us. They might have left the campground before we did all quiet like, but we're both light sleepers. And that's unlikely. To this day, we can't explain what happened.
When I was nine years old, my dog died of old age. She was a 14 year old German Shepherd, and she had been on her way out for a while. Her name was Holly, and she loved to hang out with my dad in his room. She was relatively small for her breed, but she was still very playful. When I was 11, I woke up to hear a dog panting in my front yard. It was dead silent in the middle of summer, and I looked outside to see a German Shepherd standing at my dad's window. How funny, I thought, just like Holly. I go outside to see the dog and it's almost overjoyed to see me. Very happy dog for meeting it the first time. And this dog felt the same way about my whole family. This must just be a coincidence though. I'm curious as to why it chose our house to walk up to at 7am though. And we contact the owner of the dog and he starts making his way to our house to pick up his dog. Here's where it gets creepy. This dude lived far away. He told us that his dog had run away a few nights ago, but he didn't think she'd come that far. It was only a few towns away, but that's still quite a distance for a dog to travel. We asked the owner what the dog's name was. Holly. We started laughing. We told him we had a German Shepherd called Holly. When we asked her age, they told us she was two, and she was born right after our dog died. We're baffled at this point, so we tell him the story. Everyone seems to think that the whole scenario was a big coincidence, and that it was really funny that it happened. But I always wonder if Holly came back after that day in order to hang out with us one last time, or if it was just some dumb, lost dog. My wife has a freckle on the palm of her hand. It was just under her left thumb, about the size of a pea. I loved that freckle, would kiss it, name it, joke around with it. We've been together 20 years and got married back when we were 21 in 1994. About two months ago, I was looking at her hands and her freckle was gone. What happened to your freckle? What freckle, she says. I get a little freaked out and say, the one you've always had on the palm of your hand. I grabbed her hand and looked closely and there was a faded scar where the freckle was. She tells me that she had a freckle there and that she had it removed about a year before she met me. She said it popped up really quickly and that it freaked her and her mum out because it appeared so fast and they had it removed and tested for melanoma. It was negative. I remember that freckle people. I remember kissing it and touching it when I would hold her hand. Like I said, this happened two months ago. I cannot shake the feeling that somehow my consciousness slipped sideways into a very, very similar universe to the one I started out in. But I feel like the people around me aren't really the people I used to know. It's very disconcerting. And if I didn't have really awesome compartmentalization skills, I could see this as really driving me crazy in short order. I like to be impulsive at night, and I don't mean break into buildings impulsive, though I have been there too. This time it was just to go for a long drive, clear the thought kind of situation. Me and a friend hopped into her car and drove out of town in an effort to end up in the middle of nowhere, which isn't hard living here in Australia, as most of our landmass is just forest land and desert once you leave civilization. So plenty of space to find yourself lost in. We kind of expected to get lost part way through the drive, of course. That's half the fun. What we didn't expect was after driving through Cali North, we found ourselves in the middle of nowhere, on a road caged on the sides by snow white trees that often looked to be glowing in what was extremely low moonlight. I noticed that we left Cali North at like eight at night, 
sending out texts to loved ones on my friend's phone for her. We were getting somewhat crap signal the entire drive, but it hadn't dropped out yet. And when we hit these white trees, the signal dies. Messages are now unable to send. Even Spotify perishes, despite the fact we downloaded the songs onto the phone. And suddenly the road begins looping in perpetual S-bends that we couldn't shake. Generally, I follow a rule of driving at night. That is, if weird stuff starts to happen, you don't just turn around in the middle of nowhere. So I tell my friend to look for a driveway or some kind of invitation to turn around rather than doing a U-turn right there and then. While in this looping S-Bend drive, we see a sign in the trees. I think I saw it at least eight times over. Who knows how many? I couldn't count. The sign was old and mostly rotted away, carved out to say, Touchwood. And now looking for it, I can't find any sign of a road or place called Touchwood at all. We eventually do find a spot to turn around, not far from the sign. It actually looked like it appeared from nowhere, considering we'd been apparently looping for about a half hour now. After turning around, we managed to get out of there, head back to Cali North, and our signal returns. Thank goodness. Everything comes back on our phones, Signal, Spotify, the works. And we find out that a half hour spent in the loop was apparently four hours. It's past midnight by the time we even return to our town. Both of us are weirded out and somewhat excited at the same time. But like, I've spent over half my morning looking at satellite images of the region, scouring Facebook groups of the area and such, looking for this Touchwood place. And the road we were on doesn't seem to exist. Nothing about the trip was normal. The S-Bend looping roads that never stopped, and the sign repeating itself every few bends. And, of course, the four hours of lost time. Unsure if we drove into a pocket dimension or something, but we were very much freaked out. When I was in middle school, starting seventh grade, my sister told me she ran into Rudy, who was wondering how I've been, and if I was coming back to our middle school after summer. I had no idea who Rudy is. My sister thought she knew him. My friends knew him, and apparently he was one of my best friends. But I didn't know him. I met him for the first time in seventh grade, and he just kind of hung around with me and became part of my friends. My friends didn't seem to not know him, and treated him like he was part of the group. My sister said that he told her of the times my best friend and I, and him, hung out at the pool or played video games. I recently asked her if she had ever seen me hung out with him before seventh grade, and she said she didn't know, but that he knew so much about me and even recognized her as my sister, that she assumed that we were friends. I honestly don't know who he is. I lost contact after freshman year, but it's always creeped me the hell out. Maybe I was friends with him and completely forgot about him, but I seriously doubt that. Who the hell is Rudy? Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's glitches. If of course you did, don't forget to let me know down below and do all the good stuff like press the bell and subscribe and do the like. All of those things would be great. If there's a story you would like to share, you can send it to my Reddit or email. Info also in the description. As always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons for your support. It really means the world to me. And if you would like some pretty cool prizes, feel free to check out the link to my Patreon, which you can find at the top of the description. For as little as a dollar a month, you can really help me out and get some sweet prizes for doing so. So think about it. In any case, it's now time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.